Okay. All right, so we're continuing the series on Pirkei Avot. Very exciting, interesting uh, area of learning. Pirkei Avot, as you know, is different than just plain halachot or plain mishnayot. It involves morals, it involves ethics, it involves good advice. In some ways it is similar to Mishlei and Kohelet. Generation after generations, the Chachamim have given us advice that was not only proper and useful back then, it is something that is useful for all generations to come. This is part of our Torah. This is part of our heritage. This is something that Jews all over the world learn, especially between Pesach and the summer. There is a custom to read, and actually it should, it should be to learn, Pirkei Avot, for a variety of reasons. We, we began, of course, to learn before Pesach because we're going to be spending a lot more time than the average on, on every single Mishnah. There's a, lot of depth, there's a lot of depth to it, various commentaries, but the main idea behind these words is that we should implement them in our lives. In other words, that we should learn them, understand them, and adapt them. Uh, this is what Torah is all about. It's not just to read it, it's to make it a part of your life. Torah is a way of life. It's not just teachings. An interesting philosophy, an interesting idea, I'll buy it. No, it's not just if you're ready to buy it or not. It's something that is part of us. This is, this is our Torah. This is our teaching. This is our Chachamim who were entrusted with the transmission of this Torah. And this Torah is not something that was made up by them. This is all from Sinai. That is why we began the Kavot with that very important statement that Moshe Kibel Torah mi Sinai. Not just the Torah that we see in the Chumash, but all of this, all of what the Chachamim have said is in the spirit of the Torah. Nevertheless, the Chachamim did say things, did make statements that had to do with personal experiences. They had personal experiences with their people in their generation, problems and issues that came up, and therefore they expressed themselves the way they did. What they taught, what each one taught was unique to his time, perhaps, but it also is applicable to all times. In other words, they made certain observations and which they very much wanted to share with us. Obviously, anything that is documented here is not just an observation. It is something of great importance. It is something very useful, something that we, re we really should learn and adapt. Some people think that the Torah, the Gemara, the Mishnah is only for Chachamim, for rabbis. This is not so. This is not deep Kabbalah that is only for the very few. This applies to everyone. This is something that everyone can learn, men and women. This is something that speaks to all levels. There's so much that every one of us can learn from it. But without learning, we don't know. So, Baruch Hashem, that, that we make an effort to learn. And by learning, hopefully, Bezat Hashem, there's a chance that we will adapt some of these uh, important midot characteristics and advice in our life. We're holding Mishnah Yod. Mishnah Yod is advice about work, advice about a profession, advice about keeping busy, and it tells us what to do and what not to do. Shemaya ve'aftalion kiblu mehem. Shemaya Aftalion was the next generation following Shimon ben Shatach that we said last time. They are the ones that receive the transmission. They are the ones who are responsible for teaching the Torah to, to their generation. And they're telling us something that is not necessarily a commandment in the Torah. Obviously they taught those too. They're telling us something that has to do with work. Work, believe it or not, is important. And they tell us, Ehov et ha You should love work. You should want to work. What's so, so special about work? What are they talking about? Why, they, why 
put an emphasis on work. A lot of people don't enjoy working. <laughs> they want to hear about work. And here Shemayan Aftalion come and tell us that yes, Torah is of course important. Mitzvot, of course, you can't do without. But melacha is something important too. Melacha means to physically work or to have some sort of profession to provide for yourself. A means of, uh, of, of, uh, of, a, of a living. In order to be able to eat, in order to be able to survive, to, to pay bills, one has to work. That's just a fact of life. But here, Shemayin and Aftarion are telling us not just to learn a profession or to actually work, they're telling us to love to work. That's what's a little bit interesting here. Why to love to work? There are various explanations as to why they, they word it in this way. Number one, there are individuals out there who feel that it's beneath their dignity to do certain things. They may have a degree in engineering, and now they've moved to the United States from Russia or from whatever, and they don't just want to take any job. It's beneath my dignity to go uh, uh, do, you know, some, uh, uh, let's take an example, packaging, right? Things that are, are totally not uh, their line of work, totally something that they're not used to, so they, they react in a very negative way. I'm an engineer, they say. How could I do this? And Shemaya and Aftalion are telling us to be realistic. You have a family to provide for. You have to feed your kids. This is not a time to talk about your degree, your PhD and your engineering, if there is no such position available. You do whatever is possible even if it means sweeping the streets. That's what many Jews did in Israel when they first came to Eretz Israel after the war, after World War II. They saw what the country looked like. They saw whatever opportunities were available. And many great people, rabbis, important people, went ahead and did all kinds of menial jobs. Because they had to survive, very simple. And guess what? The rabbis tell us there's nothing wrong with that. On the contrary, that is respectful. It is better that you have something to do than just struggle and have your family suffer for no re real reason. Do you know that the, the, there is a certain amount of people who are unemployed in every country? Do you know that a certain percentage, percentage of those that are unemployed, it's not because there are no jobs for them. They don't want to work. Or they don't want to work unless it pays triple digits, you know, unless it pays a good salary, unless it's exactly what they want. What do you think? It's, it's, you're going to get something custom made exactly to your wishes? It doesn't work like that. Life is not all a bed of roses where everything just is perfect where you get to pick and choose exactly what you want in a wife, exactly what you want in a job, exactly what you want in a house. People want to buy a house. You know, you think they're going to be very, very picky about every little detail, they're never going to buy a house. You say, okay, this has the amount of bedrooms, this does, this does the job, right? It's comfortable, that's it, it's in a good neighborhood, forget it. The price is right and so forth. So the rabbis tell us, even if it means pshot nevelota beshuka, you have to sell stinking hides, the hide, you know, the skin of an animal, it's smelly. Even if it means you have to sell the, involve yourself in selling that in the street, in a public area, do that the Altomar Gavra Rabani. Don't say, I'm an important person, this is beneath my dignity. No, no. This will bring food on the table. You do even that. Obviously, this is not anybody's first choice. But look at garbage collectors. Who wants to be a garbage collector? Do you know what a garbage collector is? Except the ones in Los Angeles, of course. They have a great job. They sit in a comfortable car, and they have machines picking up the garbage cans. <laughs> Go to New York and see what garbage collecting is. All the plastic bags are, are, are piled up on each other on the street. 
no containers necessarily, and they're grabbing one by one and throwing it into the car. I think they have gloves, yeah. <laughs> it's hard. So why are they doing it? There must be other jobs. It pays well. They have good benefits. They have a pension probably coming. It does the job. Okay, it's not so respectful. I don't know, I don't think they would be so proud to tell people, uh, what's your job? They probably, if they're asked a the question, they may say something like, I'm in the sanitary division of the city. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. Just to, you know, not say garbage. But, anyway. But that's what the Chachamim basically said. Nothing is beneath your dignity, really. If you have to do something, just do anything. Another reason why it's important lehovet hamelacha is that even if you have money, even if you have money, you want to always keep busy. Keep busy. Keep busy is very important so one does not come to batala. Batala means boredom, and boredom leads to, in other words, batala means having nothing to do, and nothing to do leads to she'amum, boredom. And that leads to sin. The mind looks for all kinds of things to do when it's bored and it's unoccupied. So being occupied is very, very healthy, very, very important. Even if you have money, you don't need to work, you want to keep busy, it's healthy. When a person works for a living, the chances are somewhat smaller or lesser that he'll come to steal, because he has an income, hopefully assuming that that income is sufficient then he will not resort to stealing. Who steals? One who doesn't work. <laughs> That's his job. <laughs> he knows he replaces a regular profession with a, dis with a different kind of profession called stealing from others. So having a job, having some sort, some sort of uh, business will hopefully, hopefully lessen the chances that this person will have to resort to stealing. When a person works, it's a certain, it's a certain uh, feeling of satisfaction that he gets from working. Because not working would, would create a situation that he has to depend on others. So the difference between working and not working really is, is pretty big. It's not just money. It's create, not working is creating a dependency on others. Whether it's a dependency on the system, and in France and in England, they're spoiling. They really spoil the people. I think here too, somewhat. They're spoiling people by giving them all these benefits that they don't really necessarily, uh, I don't know to say deserve or, or need. They can work. I mean, obviously somebody that cannot, for whatever reason, the government should help them. But there's so many people that don't really need to or shouldn't go and receive these benefits because they can work, they can contribute to society, which leads us to the next point. Man was created to contribute to society. To be an active member of society means that you're involved. You work, you contribute, you improve, you repair, whatever it is. Everybody in his capacity does something constructive to, for humanity. Getting married and having children is also a contribution. It's, it's preparing the next generation. And that's what man needs to do, to contribute everyone in their way. Everyone has a mission, everyone is unique in some way. But there needs to be that nechonut, as we say in Hebrew, that willingness to, to do so. If a person does not have that understanding or that willingness, and obviously he's going to be lazy, he's not going to be in the mood, he's going to come up with some excuse that he wants to retire now and, then, and, and travel the world. In Judaism, there's such a thing as retiring from Torah at least not, because we have a commitment of observing mitzvot until we leave this world, all the time. It's not that you stop doing something. With physical work, obviously you can't go on forever, I mean, depending on, the, on, on one's body, how much it can handle. But I know doctors that are continuing to work even in their later years, even past 80. Mm -hmm. Teachers in, who are teaching even past 90. You know, volunteers who were in the late 90s. Yeah, some who were really capable, who wanted to keep busy. That's what they were doing. 
Another reason why it says Ehov et HaMelecha, love the work, is because one should strive to love what he's doing. Oy vavoy, it's really sad if a person wakes up in the morning and he feels terrible about going to his work or to his job. He doesn't like it. When one does not like what he does, he won't succeed. In he won't do a good job. You have to take pride in what you do. You have to enjoy it. I mean, obviously, that's something very difficult to expect from everyone because not everyone is involved in a job that they like. They're not, some people are miserable. Well, maybe you should look for a different job then. Because if you're going to be miserable, if, you're going to, if, if you don't have a good attitude towards your job, you're not going to do well in that job. You're going to cut corners, you're going to call in sick, or whatever. You're not, you're not, you're not excited to do it. Who wants that kind of a worker, that kind of an employee who doesn't like what he's doing? So obviously, I mean, one needs to do his best. It, it, of course, depends on his mazal, depends on what Nishamayim they have in, in mind for him. But the attitude should be, at least, it pays the bills. If the attitude is good and healthy, then that's it. Do your best. So that's as far as melacha. That is, we spoke about the benefits in, of having a melacha. What should a person not strive to get? Stay away from positions of leadership. Okay, what's that supposed to be? What's wrong with being a leader? Some people, when they learn this Mishnah, they interpret the word Rabbanut as being rabbinical positions. It's not necessarily a rabbinical position. Any, leader, any leadership position, any position of authority is also called Rabbanut. Some people like the job of delegating to others, of telling others what to do, being on top, which leads to abuse. <laughs> you should like the work. You don't have to strive to, be to, to get to the top. There are some disadvantages of being on the top, but we'll get to that soon. So the simple interpretation of Snayata Rabbanut is try to avoid aiming for that position. Eventually, somebody's going to get to that position. Yes, of course, there are promotions. Somebody has to take the role of a leader. Somebody's going to be the CEO, president, the rabbi. Of course, we need these people in, in those capacities. But that should not be your aim, because if that's your aim, that's, it's, an, it's a position more of control, controlling others. It's not so much of service. Melacha involves service. Contributing, helping, doing. Whereas Rabbanut involves control, being on top of others, telling others what to do. Stay away from that. That's not what you should want to be. You should want to serve. What's wrong with Rabbanut? Well, there are several problems with it. First of all, when a person gets to that position of Rabbanut, it creates a lot of tension or conflicts with certain people. Those conflicts are called politics. Politics. People in those higher positions are asking for some trouble, some hassle. It, it, it invites envy from those people who didn't make it to the top. It invites criticism from those who say, ah, oh, he doesn't do his job. You see what I mean? That position invites trouble, invites problems. They may be suspicious of him, that he's mismanaging, right? all kinds of things. Right? And that is why when it comes to being in a leadership position, what, is, what the Kavanah of this Mishnah is, Ehov et ha shel Rabbanut, but not the Rabbanut itself. In other words, you should like the work that the leadership position entails, but not the title, not the position. The actual work, whatever work is involved that you will be doing, that's fine. Contributing, serving, helping, whatever it is. That you should like. When it comes to Rabbanut, like the melacha of the Rabbanut, but not the Rabbanut itself, not the title. Who needs a title? But some people aim for that. That's what they want. They want the badge. They want the uh, whatever, you know, the salary. Right? That's what, the, what, what a person should aim for. People in rabbinical positions or in positions of, of authority or leadership also can be easily tempted 
to commit all kinds of, uh, of faults. There's all kinds of temptations that come with a big job. And one of them is abuse, of course. People in high positions can become easily arrogant and uh, take advantage of those people who are beneath them, who are lower than them in position. So that's why Shemaya and Naftaniyon are telling us, listen, be careful with this because it is tempting. It may be easier to do, less work. You're on top, people love honor. Some people love honor. So this may be something that will tempt certain individuals who, who want honor, right? The salary. It says that's not something that you should want. That's not something so good that you should aim for. If you get it, neshamayim. Okay, fine. Neshamayim, they're going to want somebody in that position. But that's not what you should want to have for yourself. You should want to be a servant. One that will help, one that will contribute in a positive way and not have the trouble of controlling others, which has its own problems. The next point the Shemayan Aftanyun tell us is Ve'altit Vadal Arashut. Very interesting idea. Obviously, they must have experienced something in their time. They had to deal with authorities. Rashut means the authorities. It means government. Don't make yourself known to them. Don't be their buddy. Don't try to uh, get too close to them. Altit vada, don't let them know about you. What's wrong with that? Maybe they will help you. If you get too close to them, no, 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 no. The rule of thumb is when it comes to Rashut, Rashut is government, they want to use you. If you ever come close to them, if you ever become familiar with them, buddies and so forth, go to lunch together, whatever you want to, uh, whatever you want to say, in the end, it's what they're looking for. It, if they have an interest in you, they'll be close to you. In other words, they need you. But if you ever ask them for a favor in the future, they're gonna, give, they're gonna let you down. We've seen it over and over again in history where Jewish people were in very high positions in Spain and the like. And in the end, it didn't help them. They were expelled. It just invited trouble. They were the best. Minister of Finance, advisors to the king, you name it. It was it, the interest of the Gentiles, it was the, the governments who wanted the knowledge or the experience of the Jew, but once they got it and they didn't have a, any use for him, they disposed of him. So if you think it's beneficial to get to know them, to get close to them, you are wrong. There are times that we need to intercede. Yes, we used to send a special messenger who was familiar with the customs and traditions and language of the, of the, of the government. Fine. So he was the one that represented us for whatever we needed. But on a regular basis, don't think that it's such a good idea to get to close out a country. You will be hurt from this. How will you be hurt other than the fact that they're not going to help you? Well, what can happen very, very easily is that when one gets too close to government, the circles, it has an impact on his religious life. People don't realize that. But when you get involved in politics and you get close to government authorities, you are asking for trouble. You're, in other words, you're inviting challenges that you may not have had before. Somebody invites you for, for his Xmas dinner. Why don't you come to my Xmas dinner? Well, what are you going to say? You're going to go. A lot of people go. You're going to say, well, there's nothing wrong with going. I'm not going to eat. Okay, so he went. What if everybody's eating and he's not eating? He's going to feel uncomfortable. You have to be very strong. I was invited at, my, at work when I worked for the county many times for such parties. So what did I say? I'm sorry. You know, I eat kosher. Oh, very, very, you know, without any shame. I eat kosher, you don't. So you know what they told me? No problem, bring your kosher food with you and sit <laughs> with us. Now what? Am I gonna begin to explain to them Marit Ein? There is halakha that nobody's allowed to see me in a non-Jewish place with my kippah on it. 
They won't understand what that means. So what, I told them something which makes a little bit more sense. You know, I, I'm just allergic to smelling pork. <laughs> <laughs> I can't take the smell of all these things, all these foods. Yeah. So what did they do? They really, they really, really, really wanted to enable me to, sh to, to be with them, which was very nice of them, really. They really wanted me to share with them. They said, okay, this year we're all going to go to the park. No restaurant, we're all going to bring our food there just for you so you can be with us. I said, oh, that's fine. They really went out of their way for me it's to eat in the park, not in a restaurant. You know, bring my own food. And other. They understood. They respected. Very nice of them. Mm -hmm. But that's not every, every situation is not like that. There's a lot of pressures. Not everybody can stand up to the pressures. People take off their kippah, not to appear different. People do all kinds of things because you're, if you're not strong, you can't resist. So th that's one of the dangers. Yes? Uh, I believe that there's a restriction that you're not allowed to have a meal with Goim because it builds friendship and it can lead to other things. Of so, course, yeah. So but, was it... But that's just... That, that what you're talking about is are the prohibitions or limitations when it comes to eating their food. No, sitting at a table with them. Not necessarily sitting at a bar with them, <coughs> uh, eating from their foods. The Chachamim spelled out what we should stay away with. Befriending them is not so much of a problem, as long as it's not man-woman, because then that leads to other kinds of problems, right? Uh, otherwise, I mean, you want to have a lunch at a Jew. They, by the way, one year or on two occasions, actually, they wanted me to eat with them, not Xmas, New Year's or something. Guess what? They say, you choose a kosher restaurant. <laughs> Isn't that nice? Very nice. Yeah, on two occasions, I think it was. We actually, I told them it's a little far where I live. No problem, you know, from downtown to here. Yes, they all, most of them came. And guess what? Oh, kosher food is great. Yeah. It's a little expensive, but... <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, yeah, if you're strong and you're proud, they respect you. Yeah. But not everybody understands that. So the Chachamim have to tell us, just stay away. Because the tendency is that people become weaker. And how do you become weaker? One way is not, of course, not necessarily joining them, but many times one may lose the, the trust that he has in Hashem because he thinks he can trust them. You know, Israel says, we're going to trust America. Sure. They're going to let you down. They have interests. They're not your friends. It's all about interests. If they have a bigger interest than you, and one of them is oil, they're going to let you down, like they did in the past. So by developing this trust with them, one is removing his trust from Hashem. So from various angles you can see here that the Chachamim dissuaded us from getting too close to them because there are very few benefits in the country that one can get hurt, if anything, from being too close to the Rishut. All right, next Mishnah. Mishnah Yud Aleph. Avtalion Omer, Chachamim Izaru Bedivrechem. Now he speaks to the rabbis, to the teachers. Be careful with your words, whether it's your classes, your lectures, your speeches. Be careful how you say things, because there may come a time. Shema tachovu chovat galut. Ve'tiglu lemakom ma'ay maraim. You may end up going in galut, leaving Israel, leaving a place of Torah, and you may end up in Mongolia, or whatever, galut. And in that other community where you may end up, is a makom of ma'ay maraim. It's a, bad, it's a place of bad waters. This is referencing people who are not educated, people who are possibly heretics, uh, people who are malevolent, in other words, bad. Maim haraim, people who do not have uh, the, the Torah's best interest in mind. It's called maim haraim, bad waters. Bad waters meaning that they have a totally different agenda than 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 you. And you may end up amongst them. And guess what? And if you're amongst those kind of people, 
and you teach them and they misunderstand you, the students who will drink from you, from what you've taught them, and they will not understand well what you've said, they will die. They will die from that because they did not follow the halacha. And if students of Torah die, mm -hmm. then the name of Hashem, God forbid, will be uh, will be desecrated. So in other words, Aftalion is telling us Chachamim have tremendous responsibility because the words can lead to all kinds of consequences that we don't even anticipate. Uh, there's, there, is, there is quite a bit of an emphasis on how to teach, how large the group should be depending on what topic is being taught because if the group is too large and people do not have a chance to ask questions and they misunderstand, that's it. Not only will they not follow things correctly, they may teach it to others in the wrong way. And that is similar to what we learned in the very beginning of Rikia Avot with Antigonos, Ish Socho. That two students of his, Tzadok and Baitus, misunderstood that, that there's no reward in the world to come. Because all he said was, don't do things in anticipation of reward. Oh, he meant there's no reward. No, he didn't mean that. He just said, don't do things. In anticipation, do the mitzvah because that's the right thing to do, because you're commanded to do it. Don't do so because you're going to be rewarded for it. That's not good. That's not the right way to do it. He never said that there's no reward, but they, of course, took it out of context. They uh, misinterpreted it. And uh, they were upset for other reasons, too. You know, it's, it's various factors which led them to form their own school of thought, the tzdukim and the baitusim, which basically meant... Uh, their philosophy was, we don't accept the authority of the Chachamim. Torah Be'Balpeh Torah be -bal is not necessarily Torah Mina Shemaim, according to them, and we know it is Mina Shemaim. So, of course, they disappeared eventually from the scene. But we had other groups. Don't think that we don't have such groups. We had, we had the Karaim, very similar group that emerged later on in, our, in history. And we even have today the conservative and reform movement and uh, some other movement called something else. I don't, I don't even remember. All kinds of movements. What are these movements coming from? Because they're interpreting things the way they want to. They want, they want Judaism to comply with their way of life. Instead of having their way of life comply with the Torah, they do it the other way around. You know, it has to comply with me. It has to comply with 20, 21st century. Things have changed, so let's change the Torah. No, 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 no. The Torah is not changeable. But, of course, because they are Maim Haraim, Maim Haraim means they're not eager to do that which is the divine will. They're bad waters, waters that are not drinkable, but waters that are, that are just no good, right? That's what it does. It, it creates all kinds of new uh, ideas about religion, about uh, life, things that are, are completely not compatible with the Torah. So the Chachamim tell us, therefore, be careful with how you present the Torah, especially in such places where there, there may be some elements who are against it, who are opposed to it, and they are going to look for any chance that they get where they find something. Oh, he said that, or he did that, or, you know, Anything to besmirch the tradition, to besmirch the rabbis. And you have it today, unfortunately, in Israel, with certain elements of society, especially journalists, who look for any, anything that a rabbi did that was wrong, and they magnify it. A rabbi was caught, you know, in big, bold letters, headlines, headlines. Right? Just to besmirch. That's their only intention, to, to, to show how this is so shameful, how this is so negative. And obviously, they're not being very uh, honest. It's a, it's a big lie. But that's what it is. We have to contend with these kinds of elements in society. There are such people who are dangerous. Maim Maraim, they're called. And therefore, uh, we have to be careful. Those who teach, those who try to influence others, have to be extra careful with what they say. Okay, and now we've come to the third Mishnah that we'll do today. 
very, very important Mishnah. This Mishnah is quoted quite a bit throughout Chazal, throughout the words of the rabbis, as you will see why. It involves certain characteristics that we should always strive to acquire. And as you will see, the reason I say the word acquire is because not everybody is born with this. And that is why the idea here is strive to acquire the following characteristics. Mishnah Yudbet. Hillel and Shammai kiblu mehem. The following generation was the famous Hillel and Shammai, who also formed two schools who were not necessarily opposed to each other. Actually, they worked together to strengthen the Torah in different ways. And they also taught us some very important ideas. Beginning with Hillel. Hillel omer heve mitalmidav shel Aaron. Hillel used to very much teach that it's so important to try one's best to be like the st students of Aharon. You may not be like Aharon himself, but try to be like his students. Try to follow in his, his ways. What are the ways of Aharon? What is the, what is the school of thought of Aharon? Ohev shalom, verodev shalom, ohev etabriyot mekarvana Torah. Always pursue peace, love peace, pursue peace, love people, love humanity, and bring them close to Torah. Okay, how is this a continuation to the previous Mishnah or Mishnayot? I, I always find that there's some connection between the Mishnayot, at least with the ones that are close to each other. And the, the connection that I see here, perhaps, has to do with the fact is that you know, at times we do meet up with difficult people. My maraim. At times we do have to work with very challenging situations. My maraim are people or students or whatever you want to call them who are Jews who are not interested. It's not just ignorant people. And here, Hillel is telling us that even with such people, there's a chance you can make a difference in their life. You can have an impact on them. You know how to. You, you know how this could happen. Only if you follow the school of thought of Aaron. If you pursue peace, if you're kind, compassionate to them, speak nicely to them. That's the only way you can win them over. Who is telling this? Who's telling us this? Hillel. You want to know what, who Hillel was? This is very befitting to somebody like Hillel. Hillel was a man of tremendous patience and tremendous love and care and was very caring to others. But he was a very unusual person. He was unusual in that you can never get him angry. <laughs> now that's really interesting. Not to ever get him angry. Yeah. So, this became very famous. Two guys had a bet. One says, you know, I bet you that I can get him angry. I bet you you can't. And the bet was for $400, whatever the currency was back then, 400 So the guy who said he can get him angry went to him Friday, a few minutes before Shabbat. Now, what's any normal religious Jew doing a few minutes before Shabbat? Mm -hmm. Getting ready. Last minute things. Shower, bath, whatever, well, candles, on. knocking on the door, Hillel, where is this Hillel? <laughs> what could this be? He says, it's me. Yes, how could I help you, my son? Very, very calmly, please have a chair. Maybe even offered him a cup of coffee, I don't know. <laughs> how can I help you? Didn't say anything about why you come now, why can't this wait? Don't you see that? Why? Don't you see? <laughs> and he actually opened the door. Some people would have just not, not, not opened the door. Yes, was not in any way, did not feel in any way bad that he was bothering him and calling him Hillel. You know, no, no reaction, no negative reaction. Yes, how can I help you? Tell me, why are the inhabitants of Africa, the people who live in Africa, why do they have flat feet? A normal person would have said, what kind of a question is this? Ahead of Shabbat, right before Shabbat. This is not an emergency. 
he answered him the question because they walk on marshes you know their 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 feet are wider so they should not sink in you know the words because of the environment they develop you know wider feet continues on I have another question go ahead why are the eyes of these people who live in this c country slanted so he gave him another explanation as to why their eyes are slanted because of the winds the, the sandstorms and whatever and in this way he asks him some other questions very strange questions that have nothing to do with Shabbat no halakha so after he gets all his questions answered he tells him he, sir are you Hillel the ones that that, that they, the, the, the leader the Nasi yeah he says yes I am the one may there not be any more people like you in this world wow that's a curse he says why not what did I do to you he says, because I made a bet, and you made me lose it. <laughs> you never got angry. He says, may you lose two times as much, and I should never get angry. <laughs> anyway, this is Hillel. You know, he never got angry. So he's the one telling us, this is the right attitude. This is the right temperament. This is the way to deal with people. What's so special about Aharon? The Midrash speaks a lot about Aharon. Who was Aharon? He was such a person. Oim Shalom, Rodev Shalom. All of Am Yisrael cried when Aharon passed away because they all loved him. One unique example of Aharon's uh, involvement with people and his pursuit of peace is, as the Midrash points out, I think it's the Midrash, that he would once he would hear occasionally. Uh, that let's say Reuven and Shimon are fighting. They, have a, they had a big fight and because of the fight they're not even on speaking terms anymore. That's how, that's how upset they are at each other. He would go over to Reuven. Reuven, you know, Shimon feels terrible about this whole thing. He really regrets it. He feels bad that it ever happened. He really wants to make peace. He just, he's embarrassed. So Reuven would say, really? That's how Shimon feels. Wow. Then she would go over to Shimon and say the exact same thing. You know, Ruven is really very, very sad. He feels terrible that this thing happened between the two of you. You were once good friends. You really would want to make up. He would have preferred that something like that would never have happened. He says, really? After a day or two, these two would meet up and they would embrace, a hug, and make up. Nothing really happened. Neither one ever said, I'm sorry, or I'm sad. He would say that, just to bring them together. And this is how he would achieve. This is how he would accomplish making peace between enemies. That's incredible. That's called Rodef Shalom. He would pursue. He would make an effort to make peace amongst people. This area of Rodef Shalom is especially important today and at all times in Shalom Bayit. Uh, many times husband and wives are having terrible problems. One has to do his best to avoid them ever going to the court and getting a divorce, if, if at all possible. Shalom Bayit is a tremendous mitzvah to make peace amongst partners, amongst neighbors, amongst husband and wife. It's a tremendous, tremendous mitzvah. We, can, we, don't, even ima we don't even realize how important it is. So here we have various qualities. We have, first of all, Ohev Shalom. What's Ohev Shalom? Ohev Shalom is simply that Aharon was not only an individual who loved to be in peace with everyone in good terms, he also went out of his way to be Rodev Shalom. So we have being in peace in good terms with everyone, Ohev Shalom. Number two is making an effort to pursue it to make peace amongst others, which is a higher level. It involves more effort. Ohev et Abriyot, love people. Try to get along with everyone. Ume karvan la Torah and bring them close to Torah. You know what the connection between Ohev Tabriot and karvan la Torah is? Very simple. The only one who can actually bring people close to Torah 
influence them is one who is ohev et abriyot, if he loves them. People who care about others, the others will sense it. They will not be apprehensive, you know. They will not be afraid, oh, he's criticizing me, he's against me, he's putting me down. No, they will sense that he loves them. Ohev et abriyot, umekarvan la Torah. So who can really be mahzir b'tshuva? Who can really influence others to return to, 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 to get closer to the Torah? Only one who really loves them and cares about them. And they, they sense it. You can't say, oh, I love them. If they don't sense it, then it's not there. If people sense that what you're doing to them by teaching them, by preaching to them, is out of love, that, is, that will have the most effect in bringing them closer to the Torah. However, it's not only a person who is ohev tabriyot, it also has to be a person who is ohev shalom. What does that mean? It has to be that an individual is truly interested in peace. Yes, it's important to love people, but it's, he's truly interested in peace, he believes in it, and he is shalem imatzmo, he's also in peace with himself. A person, an individual who has trouble with his own character, he's an angry man, he's a lax, lax patience, or he's very disturbed in some way, he's not in peace with himself, then he cannot communicate very well. He won't be as effective. So Hef Shalom is also indicative of a person who is Shalem in Atzmo. He's complete with himself. He has this tranquility. He has this peace of mind. He can go about this with no problems. He's in peace with himself. He's calm, he's patient, he believes in this, he likes this, and besides this, he has a love for people. That means he will care about them, he will be sensitive about them. Otherwise, people don't care. Oh, let them fight it out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there are people like that. Who can, they don't care. Total lack of sensitivity towards others. It has to be that somebody really cares. Then he's able to go about it. What, what comes out of this Mishnah is as follows. That in life, we meet all kinds of people. Some are tough, very, very difficult people. One has to do his best to get along, as we say in Hebrew, with everyone, as much as possible. That is a very, very lofty goal. Do your best to get along with as many people as you can. In order to do that, one has to be prepared to compromise sometimes. One has to avoid at all costs machloket and, and, and arguments, right? Divis divisiveness, arguments. And there are all kinds of situations that could easily lead to that amongst family members. Family members, brothers and sisters, uncles and aunts. All kinds of silly things. Usually it's all about silly things. And many times about money. <laughs> right? What do they fight about? Inheritance, money. Why didn't you invite me this? All kinds of crazy things. You know, you didn't invite me to this uh, little birthday party. Well, what's, they, because of that, they don't, they don't want to talk to him anymore. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, I've heard all kinds of silly things like that. People being upset at each other. You can't do that, otherwise you're going to make enemies. The idea is to make friends. The idea is to get along with everyone. Yeah, it's not easy, but it's possible, but it requires Certain, there are certain conditions, and they are being prepared to compromise, being easygoing, flexible. You know, all, all these characteristics, these positive characteristics that only lend themselves to being friends with everyone, almost. Uh, you may still have people who are hypocrites, huh? as they're called in Farsi, doru, right? <laughs> they tell you how nice you look, and then they stick a knife in your back. You know people like that? Many. <laughs> too many. <laughs> Unfortunately, they exist too, but what are you going to do? You're just going to be careful with them. You're going to be careful with them, right? Because you know this guy's a hypocrite. This guy I can't trust. He puts up a smile, but you know, all right. They, but it doesn't mean that we have to stoop to his level and be like him. So what are some of the conditions to getting along with everyone? Flexible, willing to compromise, being careful not to speak Lashon Ara about anyone, gossiping, bad-mouthing, uh, talking gently to people, not yelling at them. All of these are basic, basic requirements of being able to get along with others and having others like us because we're like that. Yeah. 
What if you feel that the other person is going to influence you for the negative, for the worse? If you feel it's a person that you want to be friends with everyone, but you feel that the other person maybe is not on the right path? No, 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 we covered that before. We said, Al titchaber la rasha. Don't get close to somebody who's not a good person. You know, one who's completely not on the same track as you are. It doesn't say, however, Harchek, stay away from it at all costs, because maybe at some point you'll have an influence over it. It does say, Harchek Mishachen Ra, from a bad neighbor. Ra, it means really bad. Rasha does not necessarily mean bad. So Rasha, we, we sometimes use the word Rasha, evil, bad. Rasha can also mean somebody who's just simply not religious, somebody who's completely not interested in, in, in the Torah, somebody who's just going out on different derech than you are. So it's Archek, Mishachen Ra, Ve'al Titchaber Rasha. Just don't associate with him so you don't learn from his ways. The only person who can associate or get a little bit close is one who's very, very strong. And there's no risk that he's going to be affected. But there are very few people like that. The majority of people should not take a chance. But to be nice and gentle and hello, as we will see later on, there is a yesh inyan, there is a need, there is a, of, not a need, but a, a, a good idea of le kabel kol adam fort. Receive everyone with a happy countenance, with a smile. What does it cost to smile? How are you doing? Good morning. Big deal, even in the street. It's a good thing to get used to that. All of this, if a person gets used to this, it makes him... Uh, it's easier for him then to approach people who are difficult and deal with them properly. He has gotten used to <laughs> being nice, being gentle, and so forth. You meet somebody, how are you doing? How's your family? Hopefully you should mean it when you say it. But uh, this all helps. What do you do with people who you don't agree with? You can tell them, listen, I don't agree with you but I won't hate you either. <laughs> See, you know, people don't have to hate each other just because they don't agree. It's okay, so we don't agree. We agree to disagree. <laughs> you know, that's it. You know, that, that's the nice diplomatic way of, of getting out of, of a problem. All right, I understand your position. I don't agree with it. But, you know, have a nice day, you know. That's all. With those who you disagree, it should only be disagreement not hatred. There's a nice pasuk in Mishlei that we once learned that says like this, approximately, give rebuke to the Chacham, he'll love you for it, that you're teaching him, you're guiding him, you're showing him the right way. Don't try to reprimand a, a mocker, a clown, he's going to hate you. It's a waste of time. That's a simple meaning. In other words, there are some people that you want to tell them, show them, teach them. There are others that you just want to stay away with from. Those who will mock you, those who will give you trouble. There's another interpretation, however, a very cute and true interpretation of this pasuk in a different way. When you reprimand a child or even a friend, somebody that you're very close to, don't reprimand him you are nothing. You are a clown. You are totally not serious. You are good for nothing. Tell him, you are a chacham. You're so smart. Such an intelligent person like yourself. How could you do something like that? You see what I mean? In other words, the Mishle is telling us that the, the right way of, of rebuke is not to tell the child or your friend or whoever that you're close with, let's. Al tochach. Don't give tochacha. Let's, because he's going to hate you for it. You're a let's. You're a mocker. You're a nothing. Ocheach lechacham. In other words, when you want to use tochacham, when you give re re rebuke, tell him, you're a chacham. You're so mature. You're so smart. Come on, you, you're capable of this. You, you can get it. You can understand it. In other words, be positive when giving rebuke. In this way, you will be more effective, too. Rabbi Cook, Zechet Tzadik Lebrachah, the famous Rabbi Cook in Eretz Israel, yeah, over 70 years ago, was once asked, how come he's so tolerant and so loving of the secular Jews? The, very, the ones who were very distant from Judaism. He was, nevertheless, very sympathetic of them. 
He says, how could you? And it says, it says, Al Titchaber La Rasha. They told him, I, he told him, I'd rather be guilty of Ahavat Chinam than Sinat Chinam. I'd rather be guilty of, of baseless love than of baseless hatred. No. That's what I'm guilty of? Fine. Let it be this, love, instead of hatred. Obviously, we're a time in a generation where we have to fix the baseless hatred of the time of the t Second Temple era. So this is not a time to, to, uh, to, to continue in that derech. On the contrary, we have to find ways of showing that we care about every Jew. And that is why he was successful in, in uniting, in, in bringing Jews closer to Judaism. This is the right approach. Very important to be meoravi mabriot, another important idea that is expressed by Chazal. Meoravi mabriot means to be involved with everyone, to go to people's uh, events, whether it's Chazal they're more they're in mourning, or it's a simcha in the family. To be involved means to show yourself, to be with people, to meet with people, to be helpful to people when they need it. That's called meorav imabriot. What's the opposite of Meuram Abriyot? A Chacha Mistager, one who closes, shuts himself off at home. I don't want to go outside. Tum'ah, he says, bad people, temptations. I don't want to be there. <laughs> the only way you can grow, the only way you can be rewarded for your deeds is if you face the challenges. Being closed up in a closet is no big deal. Of course, you may not come to sin so easily. Hashem wants to see you involved and then controlling yourself. Yes, of course, it's challenging. It's not easy. But that's the only way to do it. Prove yourself. How can you prove yourself? Not if you're in your closet. Be involved with people. And then let's see you. Let's see if you care about them. Let's see if you go to the funerals. Let's see if you attend the classes. Let's see if you care about the community. Be involved. Why does it say briot? Muravim briot with people? Because briot means even non-Jews. Every human being who has the image of God on him, hopefully, as long as he behaves himself, and he's not an animal. So be meuravim abriot means with all of humanity. Be nice to everyone. It doesn't say Jew. It says briot, the creations of God. And last but not least, if you want to achieve the ultimate goal of being mekarvan la Torah, right? You have to be nice, as we said before. That's the ultimate goal here. Lekarvan la Torah. That requires tremendous compassion for people who are lost. If you don't have that compassion for people who are lost, lost souls, how are you going to do that? It's impossible. A person has to have compassion. L'rachem al abriyot. L'urav mabriyot, l'rachem to be compassionate, to be involved. Otherwise, how are you going to get to that? How is a person going to ever get to that? Now, all of these are beautiful characteristics. But they're not so easily achievable just like that. It requires a step-by-step -step development of character. There's a midrash or some commentary who brings a following example. There was once a guy, a contractor, a builder, who was asked to build a staircase for a three-story building. And he comes to the owner and says, you know what? I've only built a staircase for one story, not for three. I'm not sure if I know how to do that. He says, what's the big deal? Just do one story at a time, right? When it comes to character development, and we eventually we want to get to inspiring people, bringing them closer to Torah, you have to start from step number one, or have shalom. That's number one. You have to want this. You have to like this. You have to be shalem with yourself. You have to have self-control, right? Then, Bezat Hashem, you will make it a point and a priority to be rodev shalom, to try to attempt to to make sure between people. It's a step-by-step -step procedure. Ultimately, all of these midot are important if we want to be mekarev people la Torah. There are various ingredients here. All of these are important. And that is similar to when you buy a can of uh, some product that has various ingredients in it. And it may have the following instructions. Shake well before use. Shake well. Why shake well? Because you want to get the whole, all the ingredients. You want to be able to feel it. You want to be able to enjoy all of it. You have to shake well. The same thing is here. 
you have to shake well all these ingredients. A person has to have all of this in him before he's able to apply it. Just to finish up, I want to remind you that this, this characteristics of being compassionate and loving and caring of people is especially challenging with those who are younger and lesser than you and those who are many, many years older, you know, the old people. That is where more patience and tolerance is required. With the elderly, it's, you know, it, it's difficult. It could be difficult. And with the young ones, you may not want to have anything to do with them, right? They're immature. So in these, with these two groups, it's where it's really tested if you really care about them. It's not easy, but it's possible. The rabbis tell us, and we may see it later on at the end of the Kiavot, that it's always important to remember throughout life the best way to succeed with people, husband, wife, friends, challenging people, the best way is be a softy and don't be tough like a cedar would. Be soft like the reed, it moves. You're always going to be better off. I mean, there are times you need to be tough, of course, with other things, but in general, you will always be more successful with people in life if you're going to be soft versus hard. One of the worst midot that leads to all kinds of troubles, and we many times are guilty of it, is if a person is a kapdan. A kapdan is a person who is strict, demanding, and upset about all kinds of little things that he shouldn't be because they're not meaningful. But because of the nature of kabdanut, of being strict and of being uh, uh, just upset about every little thing that bothers you, being exacting, it leads to all kinds of troubles, to, to, to a lack of uh, smooth relationship with people. It, it creates animosity, it creates ill feel, bad feelings. So a person has to be careful not to be a kabdan, to be soft, to be easygoing, to let go. To try, even if he doesn't agree with it, to find a way to just ignore it and just to, you know, not focus so much on, on that, it, it, that this is something that he doesn't like. Since not everybody, as we said before, is born with this nature, this is beautiful, to be of the students of Aaron, to follow in his footsteps, loving, to love peace, to instill peace and pursue peace. Not everybody is born with this, and that is why the emphasis here is on a very, very unique word that's being used here. It doesn't say learn from the students of Aaron. It says, Hevei mitalmidav shel Aaron. Be like them. Yes, most people are not born with all of this by itself. You will see people who, they love it. They go and they go out of their way and they make peace. Yes, they really, really care. Yes, yeah, some people have it in their nature. The majority of people are like that. You know how much it takes for people to really make an effort, to want to make an effort, to really care and be interested in that problem the end, in the end of the other side of town? Oh, this couple's getting divorced. How many people get up and do something about it? There are people getting divorced. How many people are trying to stop it? Not enough. It's, 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 so, it's such a shame. You know, people, you know, some, pe some courts just give a divorce. Okay, did you have time to think about it? That's it. They don't really try hard. The couples for sure don't try hard enough, but even the rabbis should, should try harder. It's a big mitzvah. But what's required? All of these characteristics. You have to be Oev Shalom, Oev Shalom, Oev Etabriyot. And not everybody's born with it, so guess what? Hillel tells us, Hevei, you can become one. You need to become one. You should want to become one. Yeah, you're not born with it. Then do whatever it takes to become one. And obviously, <laughs> to become one takes some work, takes some time, but it's something that everyone can become. This is not something that is only reserved for tzaddikim. This is Pirkei Avod. Remember, Pirkei Avod, this is for everyone. Always try to be like the students of Aaron. Try to learn from his, from his ways. This is something that we should adapt to ourselves, teach our children. Don't get into fights. It's not worth arguing. Don't go to courts. Avoid machloket. Try to make peace. Be nice to everybody. Be flexible. Be easygoing. And of course, ultimately, look out for those people who have no one. Try to bring them close to Torah. And you will do that if you're going to be nice. You will achieve it. And today, this is the biggest mitzvah of the generation. The biggest mitzvah is to bring back these lost souls, too many of them out there. And we can only do that if we're nice to them and we care about them. 
And Bezat Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu should give us the tools to be very effective towards bringing as many, many Jews Bezat Hashem back to Torah. Amen. Amen.